Welcome back, everyone. Part four in our CHP special 10-year anniversary program. I appreciate you all coming back. Did you know you could donate to this worthy cause I've been relentlessly committed to since 2010? That's right. Help keep this thing going for another 10 years. All you got to do is go to patreon.com and sign up. Three bucks a month. All kinds of special extras you and you alone will receive. For me, your humblest of narrators, consistently voted one of the top 10 China history podcast shows in the Apple charts. Patreon.com slash China History Podcast. You can also always throw me a few zlatis over at paypal.me slash China History Podcast if, you know, Patreon ain't your thing. Okay, showtime. I left you hanging last episode with the big meeting about to take place. Dr. Henry Kissinger, President Nixon's National Security Advisor and Special Envoy, he was on a Mission Impossible to meet with Joe and Lai to work out a few things, discuss issues of mutual concern, start working on a communique that both sides would ink their names to later on, and start preparing for the visit to China of President Nixon. We pulled the plug on the PRC all those years ago, all discussed in a number of past CHP episodes. Joe offered the hand of friendship in 1954 in Geneva, but the deal breaker was that communism thing. In those days, we'd have rather cozied up to a big old lump of polonium before we'd talk to any communists. And now, after all these years, the United States and China, represented by these two men, well, they had some catching up to do and a ton of frayed loose ends to attend to. It had been left up to Kissinger's team to prepare all the briefing papers and compile all the information required that their boss might need during the course of the discussions. Famously, there were multiple binders of papers compiled that Kissinger's team carried with them into the meeting. And when Joe sat down with Kissinger... Well, he had remarked on so many of these big, thick, black binders stuffed with all of Kissinger's briefing papers on China, painstakingly researched and compiled by Lord, Holdridge, and Smyser. Before Joe, placed on the table in front of him, was just a single sheet of paper with some handwritten notes. He didn't need any briefing books. He'd been here before, and he was very clear in what he had to say. Joe opened by saying something to the extent that it's an old Chinese custom to always allow guests to speak first. And on that note, the meeting commenced. And after the minute or so of chit-chat, Kissinger went right at it. In this episode, I'm going to let a number of excerpts from the transcript speak for themselves. Some of these words still have meaning today with the current state of affairs. In addition to excerpts from the meeting, I'll also quote from Henry Kissinger's trip recap to Nixon about the specifics of the meeting and his general impressions. As far as the reason for being there, Kissinger uttered these words that eh, more or less still ring true in this critical hour when he said to the premier of China, quote, We realize, of course, that there are deep ideological differences between us. You are dedicated to the belief that your concepts will prevail. We have our convictions about the future. The essential question for our relations is whether both countries are willing to let history judge who is correct. While in the interval we cooperate on matters of mutual concern, on a basis of mutual respect and equality and for the benefit of all mankind. Mr. Premier, I see two principal purposes for our meeting today and tomorrow— First, as Chairman Mao and you have suggested, we should work out satisfactory understandings concerning a visit to China by President Nixon, a visit he intends to make and to which he looks forward. Secondly, to make President Nixon's visit the success we want it to be, we should lay the groundwork by discussing issues between us, our mutual concerns for Asia and the peace of the world. End quote. With Taiwan being the paramount issue... Some ground rules about each side's position on Taiwan were made, and which I'll go into detail later. Taiwan was the matter most important to China, but to the United States, it was the second issue which mattered most, and this was Vietnam. Kissinger broached this subject in saying, quote, I wanted to take the liberty of discussing Indochina with you. We know your principles and your friendships. We believe that the time to make peace has come for the sake of the people of Indochina, 
for the sake of peace in Asia, and for the sake of peace in the world. I can assure you that we want to end the war in Vietnam through negotiations, and that we are prepared to set a date for the withdrawal of all our forces from Vietnam and Indochina, as you suggested before. But we want a settlement that is consistent with our honor and our self-respect, and if we cannot get this, then the war will continue, with the consequences of which you yourself have described, and which may again, despite our interests, interrupt the improvement in our relations. I know Hanoi is very suspicious, and they are afraid to lose at the conference table what they have fought for on the battlefield. And sometimes I am frank to say that I have the impression that they are more afraid of being deceived than of being defeated. They think that they were deceived in 1954. But I want to say that we are realists. We know that, after a peace is made, we will be 10,000 miles away, and they will still be here. End quote. Their discussions at one point meandered down the path of the nature of the Vietnamese people. Zhou Enlai mentioned something interesting, referring to the Hai Ba Trung, the Trung sisters of ancient times. I mentioned them in that past six-part series from early 2018 on the history of China-Vietnam relations. When remarking on the heroism of the Vietnamese people, Zhou had said, quote, They are a great and heroic and admirable people. 2,000 years ago, China committed aggression against them, and China was defeated. It was defeated by two ladies, two women generals. And when I went to Vietnam as a representative of New China for a visit to North Vietnam, I went personally to the graves of these two women generals and left wreaths of flowers on the graves to pay my respects for these two heroines who had defeated our ancestors, who were exploiters. End quote. Kissinger had replied, quote, even though they are now our enemies, we consider them an heroic and a great people whose independence we want to preserve. There are two obstacles now to rapid settlement. The two are the following. One, North Vietnam, in effect, demands that we overthrow the present government in Saigon as a condition of making peace. Secondly, they refuse to agree to a ceasefire throughout Indochina while we withdraw. I would like to tell the Prime Minister, on behalf of President Nixon, as solemnly as I can, that first of all, we are prepared to withdraw completely from Indochina and give a fixed date, if there is a ceasefire and release of our prisoners. Secondly, we will permit the political solution of South Vietnam to evolve and to leave it to the Vietnamese alone. We will not re-enter Vietnam and will abide by the political process. End quote. Joe replied, quote, Our attitude toward the Vietnam question and toward a solution of the question of Indochina is composed of the following two points. The first point is that all foreign troops of the United States and the troops of other countries which followed the United States into Indochina should be withdrawn. The second point is that the peoples of the three countries of Indochina should be left alone to decide their own respective fates, end quote. To which Kissinger replied, quote, We agree with both points. End quote. Progress was already being made. Joe pressed further, quote, Does the U.S. agree to withdraw all its military forces from Indochina, including the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marines, as well as its advisors and its military installations? Because that was the loophole in the Geneva Agreements. The war flared up from the matter of military advisors. End quote. For such a thorny issue, it was looking like the U.S. and China agreed on more than they disagreed on, and that a solution would be possible. The first day of discussions lasted well into the evening, concluding at 11.20 p.m. There was very little sizzle and lots of steak. Taiwan, Vietnam, Japan, Korea, India, all these hot topics were touched on. Again, some of the specifics I will mention when I get to Kissinger's trip recap memo that he presented to Nixon upon his return to the States. Just after noon the next day, they met at the Great Hall of the People. The same team from the day before on the China side assembled. Zhou Enlai, Ye Jianying, Huang Hua, Zhang Wenjin, and other interpreters and assistants. With regard to the matter of Taiwan and the future of normalization of relations... Zhou Enlai wanted to reiterate the points discussed the other day. These words 
would come to be very familiar and needed to be included in any U.S. statement. Quote, It must be recognized that the government of the People's Republic of China is the sole legitimate government representing the Chinese people. It must be recognized that Taiwan belongs to China, that it is an inalienable part of China which was returned to China after World War II, that, as you mentioned yesterday, the U.S. does not support a two Chinas or one China, one Taiwan policy, and does not support the so-called Taiwan independence movement. End quote. Joe thought the U.S. was still going to try and kick this can down the road a piece, despite agreeing on the main points regarding Taiwan and PRC recognition. He didn't want to offer even one angstrom of wiggle room on this most key issue for China. Joe pressed further, quote, If all these questions should be left to a later period to be solved, well, wouldn't the intermediate period be one of tension? And if none of these issues were resolved during your president's visit, then what would be the result of the visit? Not only the people in our country, but the people of the world would ask us this question and ask you that question. If the president's visit is decided and confirmed, there should be efforts to move in this direction. Of course, we do not set that as a precondition for the president's visit, but we believe that there must be a certain direction of efforts as a result of the visit, because we have always viewed the question of Taiwan as our internal affair, which we must solve ourselves. And if these questions are just hung up, then the tension that has existed between our two sides will continue to remain. End quote. The old veteran of a thousand negotiations... Premier Zhou Enlai used this meeting to circle back and review all the points Henry Kissinger had made the day before, especially with regard to the big subjects, Taiwan, Indochina, Japan, and the Southeast Asian subcontinent. Every point raised by Kissinger was addressed by Zhou with his encyclopedic knowledge of the history, much of which he had actively participated in. Joe let no stone remain unturned and sought clarification of almost everything Kissinger had said. The visit of Nixon was also discussed at length. After exchanging frank views, the two sides hashed out a joint statement on the upcoming visit of Nixon to China. Joe felt it was important that it be spun in a way that clearly indicated the visit was all Nixon's idea. Kissinger pushed back on that, and they agreed it would be said that Both leaders mutually expressed a desire to hold a summit. He wasn't going to fall for that one. They agreed to hold this historic meeting before May of the following year, 1972. After the requisite back and forth, both sides came to an agreement on the wording of the announcement they would make. The announcement read, quote, Premier Zhou Enlai and Dr. Henry Kissinger, President Nixon's assistant for national security affairs, held talks in Beijing from July 9th to July 11th, 1971. Knowing of President Nixon's expressed desire to visit the People's Republic of China, Premier Zhou Enlai, on behalf of the government of the People's Republic of China, has extended an invitation to President Nixon to visit China at an appropriate date before May 1972. President Nixon has accepted this invitation with pleasure. The meeting between the leaders of China and the United States is to seek the normalization of relations between the two countries and also to exchange views on questions of concern to both sides, end quote. Then, with the secret trip behind him, Kissinger left Beijing and snuck back into Pakistan. He flew to the U.S. and met with Nixon at his San Clemente home on July 13, 1971. Kissinger had prepared a memo to President Nixon dated July 14, 1971. It detailed all of the points discussed in Beijing over the past two days of talks along with Kissinger's comments. Let me read a few excerpts from this memo that had as its subject, My Talks with Zhou Enlai. He began, quote, My two-day visit to Beijing resulted in the most searching, sweeping, and significant discussions I have ever had in government. I spent 17 hours in meetings and informal conversation with Zhou Enlai, flanked by Marshal Ye Jianying, member of the Politburo and of the Military Commission, and Huang Hua, the new Chinese ambassador in Ottawa. 
These meetings brought about a summit between you and Mao Zedong, covered all major issues between our two countries at considerable length and with great candor, and may well have marked a major new departure in international relations. It is extremely difficult to capture in a memorandum the essence of this experience. Simply giving you a straightforward account of the highlights of our talks, potentially momentous as they were, would do violence to an event so shaped by the atmosphere and the ebb and flow of our encounter, or to the Chinese behavior, so dependent on nuances and style. Thus, this memorandum will sketch the overall sequence of events and philosophic framework, as well as the substance of our exchanges. For the intangibles are crucial, and we must understand them if we are to take advantage of the opportunities we now have, deal effectively with these tough, idealistic, fanatical, single-minded, and remarkable people, and thus transform the very framework of global relationships, end quote. In his memo, Dr. Kissinger laid out the details of the two days. Here, he describes the moment Premier Zhou Enlai made his entree. Quote, he came at 4.30 p.m. At our first encounter, like the entire visit, he was matter-of-fact, urbane, and totally at ease without any of the self-conscious sense of hierarchy of Soviet officials. After a few minutes of ice-breaking small talk and an official photograph, we moved to a conference table and launched into three hours and twenty minutes of discussions. I gave the substance of the opening statement you had approved, considerably truncated to get to the point quickly, laying out a possible agenda which we in fact took up point by point in our meetings. The summit... Taiwan, Indochina, relations with major countries such as Japan and the Soviet Union, South Asia, future American-Chinese communications, arms control, and any other topics of interest to the Chinese. He immediately moved to their fundamental concern, Taiwan, and I rejoined with our position on Indochina. Before lunch, Joe made a one-and-a-half-hour presentation, as always without notes, responding to each of the seven points on my original agenda. This was an extremely tough presentation, though put forward without rhetorical flourish. The preoccupation with Taiwan, the support for the North Vietnamese, the specter of big power collusion, specifically of being carved up by the U.S., USSR, and Japan, the contempt of the Indians, hatred for the Russians. I responded very toughly, pointing out that they had raised the issue of a presidential visit and that we could not accept any conditions. I would not raise the issue again. They had to decide whether to issue an invitation. I then launched into a deliberately brusque point-by-point rebuttal of Joe's presentation. Joe stopped me at the first point, saying the duck would get cold if we did not eat first. At lunch, the mood changed and Joe's geniality returned. I gathered the impression that his speech had been largely for the record. At the end of lunch, Joe launched into a moving account of the Cultural Revolution, which he continued to relate even after I noted that this was China's internal affair. One could tell that the revolution was an anguishing period for him. He described China as torn between its fear of bureaucracy and the excesses of revolution, with each side claiming to speak for Mao until the acknowledged excesses threatened to destroy the fruits of some 50 years of struggle, end quote. And as for Zhou Enlai, the man, Kissinger had this to say, quote, Zhou Enlai epitomized these qualities. He spoke with an almost matter-of-fact clarity and eloquence. He was equally at home in philosophic sweeps, historical analysis, tactical probing, light repartee. His command of facts, and in particular his knowledge of American events, was remarkable. He insisted on admitting faults in their society and protesting that their lavish hospitality was only, quote, what they should do. There was little wasted motion, either in his words or his movements. Both reflected the brooding inner tension of a man concerned both with the revolutionary fire of the next generation and the massive daily problem of caring for 750 million people one who endured the tribulations of the Long March and was now inviting the President of the United States to visit his capital. 
Joe was also genial and urbane, with a refreshing sense of humor. He displayed an easy egalitarianism with his interpreters, who had a free, though respectful, relationship with him, or with all of our party, who he consistently ushered into and out of elevators in front of him, and he was considerate in his genuine concern when one of my colleagues wasn't feeling well. In short, Zhou Enlai ranks with Charles de Gaulle as the most impressive foreign statesman I have met. End quote. Kissinger gave Nixon the bottom line on the summit, quote, I can only account for the fits and starts in the drafting of the joint communique by attributing them to a deep conflict between ideological and practical considerations on the Chinese side. Ideologically, the concept of Chairman Mao sitting down with the leader of what they call the imperialist camp must be extremely difficult for some Chinese to accept despite the prospect of its moving forward, their campaign against Taiwan. On the other hand, I believe they are deeply worried about the Soviet threat to their national integrity, realistically speaking, and see in us a balancing force against the USSR. And, unlikely as it may superficially seem, I sense that they actually do appreciate the balancing role we play in Asia. Nevertheless, it is hard for lifelong revolutionaries to act against their own principles, and we must be exceptionally careful not to drive them away. The Chinese will undoubtedly stress the Taiwan issue as the key to normalization of relations. But we can maintain that all issues of mutual concern will be discussed for the sake of Asian and world peace. On all other issues, Joe, in effect, left all the other basic principles up to you, giving us precisely what you wished. A visit of up to five days? probably one other city besides Beijing. He mentioned Mao might be outside the capital for more quiet talks with you. Minimum secret service. I really don't think security will be any problem. They said security is the responsibility of the host country. The PRC will not invite other U.S. political leaders before your visit. I emphasized it was important that our new departure in relations start at your level and not be muddled by eager politicians in advance. This would not rule out newsmen and cultural exchanges in the interim. End quote. As anticipated at the outset, there was going to have to be one more follow-up meeting to discuss specifics. But this historic initial meeting eh, didn't reap too shabby of a harvest. Here are some of the basic points. Regarding Taiwan, Kissinger explained to Nixon that Joe had insisted that the U.S., quote, recognize that Taiwan is an inalienable part of China and a province of China, recognize the PRC as the sole legitimate government of China, and withdraw all its armed forces and military installations from the area of Taiwan and the Taiwan Strait within a limited period, and consider that the U.S., ROC Mutual Defense Treaty is invalid. I responded that the Chinese were going beyond what they had said to us in their messages and in the two 1970 Warsaw talks in which they had requested the removal of our military presence only. I said that we had to distinguish between what could be done immediately and what had to be left to historical evolution. With respect to military presence, there were two components to our forces on Taiwan— those related to the defense of Southeast Asia, especially Vietnam, and those related to the defense of Taiwan. The former could be withdrawn after the end of the war in Vietnam. The latter would depend on the general state of our relations with the PRC. Kissinger further said, On the political future of Taiwan, I said we did not advocate a two Chinas or a one China, one Taiwan solution, but would accept any political evolution agreed to by the parties. We hoped that this evolution would be peaceful, and Joe said the PRC would try to keep it so. End quote. Kissinger also, in his memorandum to Nixon, gave full details of China's position with regard to Indochina, something that Nixon obviously had great concern about. All Nixon was hoping for was that China, meaning Zhou Enlai, would use their relationship with the North Vietnamese to see if any influence could be used to help put an end to this conflict. In this respect, Kissinger was able to assure Nixon that Joe said he would do his best. 
Okay, let's put the old proverbial bookmark in right here because we're starting to run long. The nice people here at Abbey Road Studios only gave me half an hour here in studio number two to record this podcast, so I gotta cut it short. We'll pick up next time in part five and continue on with Kissinger's debriefing of Nixon following the big secret visit of July 1971. Do come back for that. Until that time, ladies and gentlemen, this is Laszlo Montgomery, all hunkered down here in L.A. I only took my mask off to record this episode. And once again, I'm adjuring you to come back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.